The video game industry in 2019 is worth around 140 billion US dollars, and that's estimated to increase to 180 billion by 2021. It's given us some truly special moments over the years. But that begs the question, what year is the best year in video game history? Hey everyone, Jarek the Gaming Dragon here. If you're already subscribed and you haven't clicked that bell, be sure to do that, otherwise YouTube won't tell you that I posted anything. If you haven't subscribed, well, watch this video and maybe consider subscribing if you like it. In order to make this list, we need a criteria, and I've narrowed it down to three different points. Number one, the obvious one, how good were the games that year? Number two, how influential and revolutionary were the games that came out that year? How far forward did they push the gaming industry for decades to come? And number three, what was the impact the games of that year had on culture as a whole? I feel like this helps to take subjective opinion out of this as much as possible. Because a lot of the time when I see lists like this, it basically boils down to, well this is what I grew up with, so it has to be the best, and that's not what this list is. Before I get to the top three, here are some honorable mentions. If I don't mention your favorite game, I didn't forget it, there's just so many good games that I'd be here all week if I tried to list them all. 2011 saw the release of games like Dark Souls, Killzone 3, Saints Row the Third, Bulletstorm, L.A. Noir, Skyrim, Portal 2, and my personal favorite in the entire franchise, Battlefield 3. It also had some controversial yet good video games like Crisis 2 and the original Rage. 2005 is one of my favorite years in gaming history. It saw the releases of games like God of War, Call of Duty 2, Conquer Live and Reloaded, Devil May Cry 3, Battlefield 2, Burnout Revenge, Splinter Cell Chaos Theory, Area 51, Star Wars Republic Commando, Resident Evil 4, and my favorite on this list, the original Fear. That is one stacked year. If I was putting any placings on the honorable mentions list, 2001 would be in 4th place. It saw the release of games like Devil May Cry, Alien vs Predator 2, Fatal Frame, Conker's Bad Fur Day, Max Payne, SSX Tricky, Metal Gear Solid 2, Grand Theft Auto 3, and some big ones below this. Silent Hill 2 had a profound emotional impact on most people and definitely saw a cultural impact considering there were Silent Hill movies made many years later. Pokemon Crystal came out in 2001, and this means a lot to me because even though I had been watching the Pokemon anime for years before this and had trading cards even though I didn't play the trading card game because no one did, Pokemon Crystal was my first Pokemon game. But arguably the two biggest games of this year were Halo 1 for obvious reasons and a game that is still relevant to this very day, Super Smash Bros. Melee. I still play Halo 1 to this day, and I still watch Melee tournaments to this day. The only reason I don't play Melee at this point is because I'm too busy playing other games that are heavily inspired by Melee like say Project M, Rivals of Ether, and Slap City. But man do I have so many fond memories of playing Melee as a kid, and I'm sure many of you do as well. So now we've moved on to the top 3, and these top 3 are the same years everyone is going to put in their top 3, but the order seems to shift around. Here's my opinion on it. 2007 was a ridiculous year for games. It saw the releases of things like Metroid Prime 3, Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, the original Assassin's Creed, the original Mass Effect, God of War 2, the original Bioshock, Rock Band, Uncharted, Super Mario Galaxy, and four games that overshadowed everything else. But can it run Crisis? These are the words that came out of many PC gamers' mouths back in 2007. Crisis almost overnight became the new graphical standard and benchmarking tool for PC gaming over the next decade. 2007 saw the breakout release of Call of Duty 4. Many people don't remember that Call of Duty wasn't really that big of a franchise before Modern Warfare. Sure, it sold well, but it was not the billion dollar franchise it is today. The only thing that overshadowed Call of Duty 4's multiplayer component back in 2007 was Halo 3. It might be weird to people nowadays to think back about this time, but Halo controlled the entire shooter market. I still remember the cultural impact Halo 3 had on the world around me. Commercials were everywhere, there were midnight launches being advertised all over the place for months before the game came out. It was all over the news, if you went into stores you couldn't see anything but just Halo merchandise. I still remember all the Halo 3 Mountain Dew that turned your teeth orange. In fact, my brother still has a few unopened cans just for collection purposes. If you were playing anything multiplayer in 2007 and for the years to follow, it was probably going to be Call of Duty 4 or Halo 3. But on the single player side of things, we saw the legendary orange box. This had the releases of games we had played before like Half-Life 2 and Episode 1, but it also saw new releases. Team Fortress 2, Portal, something that was a new puzzle surprise that everyone immediately fell in love with, and the last Valve-made Half-Life game we might ever get, Episode 2. Yeah, Episode 2 was 12 years ago. Episode 2 is closer to the original Half-Life than it is to us today. 2004 was at the height of the 6th console generation, but arguably the most notable games came out on PC this year. 
We saw games like Unreal Tournament 2004, which gave birth to many mods that would eventually become real games later on, like the original Killing Floor. We saw Flat Out, we saw Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes, we saw Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow, we saw Spider-Man 2, Grant the Dotto, San Andreas, Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay. We saw the original Fable, Burnout 3 Takedown, Katamari Damashi, and some of the bigger ones, Counter-Strike Source, I don't even need to explain why that's so big, World of Warcraft set the pace for all MMOs moving forward, and here's the big four that came out in 2004. On the console side, you had Halo 2. Halo 2 basically invented Xbox Live. Even if you weren't playing Halo 2, you still had Halo 2 in your Xbox just to have that menu to see what your friends were playing. And on top of that, it was just an incredibly addictive, fun video game. I have so many fond memories of going over to my friend's house after practice or after school and playing many hours of Halo 2 when I probably should have been doing my homework. But 2004 is notable for pushing games forward technologically. We saw the releases of Far Cry 1, a game that did big worlds in a sense of scale that we had never seen before. We saw Doom 3, whose horror atmosphere still has good lighting to this day. But easily the most important game of this year is Half-Life 2. I would argue Half-Life 2 isn't as important gameplay-wise, because the gameplay is basically more or less what we already saw in Half-Life 1, but in my opinion not as good. No, the reason this game was so important is because the engine was so much more advanced than everything else out on the market. Graphically, it looked stunning, and I remember I remember thinking that there's no way anyone's computer should be able to run this back in 2004. But more importantly were all the small details that really added to the experience. At the time, Half-Life 2's facial expressions seemed so lifelike, something that wouldn't be matched for many years to come. And the biggest contribution Half-Life 2 had is arguably its physics engine. Half-Life 2 did physics in a way that made the world feel more lively than other games. They were even so confident in their physics engine that they gave you a gun that just messed with the physics. Everyone loves the gravity gun. Everyone remembers that about Half-Life 2. It stuck with people because it was fun picking up an engine and hurling at a zombie, and it looked fairly realistic. Half-Life 2 is an interesting case of it being more or less a tech demo, but still being a very good game. It took all of these advancements and blended it into this immersive feeling first-person shooter, and told a story in a way that other games simply were not doing at its time. But to me, without any question, the best year in gaming history is 1998. This year saw the releases of the original Rainbow Six, the original Unreal, F-Zero X, the original Spyro the Dragon, Need for Speed Hot Pursuit, Turok 2, Resident Evil 2, the original Metal Gear Solid, South Korea's national sport StarCraft, Banjo-Kazooie, the original Thief which kind of paved the way for stealth games moving forward, and three colossal, industry-changing games. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, the first truly 3D Zelda game. It doesn't matter how much you are into the Zelda franchise or not. This has left so much of a cultural impact that when you hear one song from Ocarina of Time, you know exactly where it plays in that game, even if you only played the game once. Games had simply not done exploration and adventure like this before, and you can still play the game today and greatly enjoy it. Pokemon Red and Blue may have came out in 1996 in Japan, but over in North America it came out in 1998. Talking about the early days of Pokemon is interesting to me. I was born in 91, and I remember there being a very clear split between before Pokemon existing and Pokemon existing. Almost overnight, it went from it not being a thing to suddenly everywhere. All of us had Pokemon trading cards, even though we didn't even play the game. All of us watched the show, and most of us played the video games. Now, as I said, I didn't start playing the games until Pokemon Crystal, but I was very much so involved with Pokemon before that. It doesn't matter how old you are or who you are, you will still have that same emotional response to whatever first generation Pokemon game you played. And for a lot of people, that was Pokemon Red and Blue. What I find most interesting about this is that if you were born around and after 1995, you likely have no memory of life before Pokemon. Pokemon has always just been this ever-constant media franchise around you that everyone loves and has probably had a pretty big impact on your life. This is probably how older people feel about me having no memory of life before Star Wars. It's over a decade older than I am. But there's certainly no way I could go without seeing Star Wars everywhere. Although, thankfully, Pokemon is free from the hands of Disney. Hopefully forever. 
To try and explain Pokemon's cultural impact on the world is difficult to say the least. It's the highest grossing media franchise of all time, and it's not even close. We're sitting here 23 years later and we're still playing Pokemon before bed every night. We're still eagerly buying the new Pokemon game. We're still buying all the merchandise, the plushies, the movies, watching the show. Pokemon is huge. It has had a huge impact on millions upon millions of people. But if you watch this channel, you are into first person shooters and I saved the most obvious game for last, the original Half-Life. First person shooters before Half-Life still kind of ran in the same vein as Doom. They didn't have much story, they just gave you enemies, you shot the enemies, you kept going. Half-Life changed all of this. Half-Life started by plopping you down into a fictional research facility that felt believable. You didn't have a gun, you weren't immediately fighting weird creatures, you were talking to scientists. You had a tangible place you existed with tangible NPCs. The conflict was properly explained and it never pulled you out of the game with a cutscene. It showed you everything in first person, even if that meant risking you not looking at what was supposed to be going on. The world Half-Life portrayed was so vastly different than the worlds other shooters had betrayed before it. It was more down to earth, but kept the fast paced action fun that we had at first person shooters in the past. And much like Half-Life 2, it had many advancements that we didn't see in other shooters as well. For example, the AI has so many tiny quirks that you just didn't see at that time. Half-Life has aged amazingly well, and in my opinion has aged better than Half-Life 2. Sure, its tech was impressive, but the blueprint it left behind was its gameplay and its storytelling. In almost every first-person shooter today, you will see Half-Life leftovers somewhere in that game. This was the overall theme of 1998. 3D games had finally matured, and this was a year for many firsts, and that's why I believe that 1998 is the best year in video game history. This is a fun diversion from what I usually do, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Thanks all of you that come out to my Twitch and watch me over there. If you want to come follow me and hang out, check out my Twitch, it is twitch.tv slash jarek4gamingdragon. My subscribers over on Twitch get to see my videos one day ahead of time. It's currently September, so you can get subs for half off. Same thing goes through my patrons, you can see my videos one day ahead of time. If you help me out on Patreon, you can click the link in the bottom right to go over there. Thank all of you for watching, and I will see you next video.